So that last video was a, a series of insights into the impact that single stressors can have on our ecosystems. But as I guess it may be obvious to you, um, certainly in the, the modern day and age where we've got anthropogenic impacts, rarely do um, environmental stresses come by alone. They're like buses. You wait for a bus and then three come along. Often there'll be a common cause, um, such as humans, that will cause multiple stresses to impact on an ecosystem all around the same time. And this being the case, Working out how stresses interact is really important. So for example, does, does having two just make things twice as bad or does it make things 20 or 100 times as bad? We, we need to understand this if we're trying to understand the impact that we're having on ecosystems. And it's safe to say that the present state of modern ecosystems probably reflects a really complex and cumulative history of stress and then stress release. And understanding that through the fossil record can help us understand how that very ecosystem will respond to the multiple stresses that we're putting on it today. So that is going to be the contents of our video number four. I'll first introduce um, some of the ideas for surrounding multiple stresses and how they can impact on ecosystems. And then I'll give you a few examples of how they do interact based on studies looking at geohistorical data. So let's start with a quick intro into these more complex situations where you have multiple stresses impacting on an ecosystem. I have to start with some bad news. And that bad news is that interactions among multiple stresses are thought to lead to very different biological outcomes than single um, stresses have. So we can't just look at a series of single stresses and then assume that the impact of each one of those applied alone will be the same impact as the three or four or five of those applied together. As such, we then do need to understand how stresses interact with one another across relevant timescales to the kind of the um, conservation issues that we're interested in dealing with. Um, and this will, if we can do so, this will help us understand and enhance the resilience of ecosystems today to the changes that we are causing. The good news is that the fossil record, uh, as represented by this beautiful fossil dragonfly from the Solnhofen Lagerstätte in Germany, can help us by providing insights that will provide the context that we need to know. So in brief, the fossil record can tell us um, or can help us to identify events that may warn of imminent collapse. So um, I will give you an example of that in the next slide. They can, the fossil record can reveal feedbacks that have stabilized the system, systems in the past. They can help us, um, fossils can help us recognize interactive effects amongst multiple stresses. Those could either amplify each other or dampen each other, um, depending on how they interact with each other. Fossil record can gain, help us gain insight into the duration of lag effects in ecosystem response. So if you apply a stressor, how long does it take until that has an impact on the things that are alive in that ecosystem? And it can also help us assess controls on slow processes in ecosystems that we can't observe in modern ecosystems today. We'll spend the rest of this video meeting just a few examples to illustrate these points. I'll start by introducing you to things called threshold events. So these are sudden changes in the state of an ecosystem after a prolonged period of stability, despite sustained or intensifying stress. So these are events where suddenly after a long time, you get a sudden shift in your ecosystem. And these can be um, a really valuable warning to us that an ecosystem is, for example, about to collapse. And fossils can provide a long-term perspective, which is important for studying these. They can allow us to identify what threshold events were in the past, and thus what to look out for when studying ecosystems today. A fine example of this is in the, um, the paper I cited here by Brush and Hill Gartner that was published in 2000. This documents the changes in species composition and abundance of submerged vegetation um, communities um, in response to human disturbance since Europeans settled in the US. Uh, they demonstrate that there was a sudden loss of submerged aquatic vegetation in tributaries of the upper Chesapeake Bay. This is a bay that's on the east coast of the US next to Delaware, shown on the left here. Um, and these authors used a series of um, 
of cores um, that are marked by black circles in this map here to understand um, the impacts that human intervention and human um, stresses had on Chesapeake Bay. And they identified this sudden loss of submerged vegetation early in the, sorry, in the early 1970s. They actually identified it, obviously, in the year 2000 when they published this. This was unexpected because water quality changes, such as nutrient stress, had been occurring in the estuary for more than a century, but nothing um, really had happened until this sudden event in the 1970s. At the time, biologists suggested that this reduction in submerged aquatic vegetation, including the species that, are shown, that is shown on the right here, represented a natural fluctuation in the population because um, this human stressor had been going on for quite a long time. However, seeds that were preserved in estuarine sediment cores that recorded the past 2000 years in this area showed that this ecological shift was a threshold response to changes in um, and use of uh, fertilizers um, that were occurring up until the 1970s. And furthermore, it demonstrated that um, the changes had begun two centuries earlier and then ident intensified in the mid to late 19th century. So these sediment cores provide us with key insights um, into what has driven this threshold event and demonstrated that it was human impactors that led to this event. And so that's really, really valuable. Fossils can also help us to test whether increased variability or slower rates of recovery from a disturbance can serve reliably as early warnings of appending major changes in an ecosystem. So this is an idea that is posited to be the case at a large range of scales from local to regional and global. Uh, a fine example of this is based on um, studies of diatoms. These are our single-celled algae shown on the left here and on the right here. Um, and this study, uh, which I've put a reference for here, so it was published in 2012 and looks at assemblage data from sediment cores in a lake in Yunnan in China. Um, so these diatom communities were combined with a mathematical model by the authors. They looked into something called flickering. This is the back and forth switching between two alternative stable states in response to environmental stresses, um, as shown, for example, by this um, line in this graph here. The statistics in this paper by Wang et al. suggest that flipping preceded a sudden shift to an alternative stable but eutrophic lake condition in the early 2000s. So this lake is now eutrophic and that means that it won't be able to support as much life as if it were not eutrophic. And this um, very sudden shift was um, preempted by the wobble that you can see in this graph on the, um, at the bottom middle here. So this wobble um, is in a phosphorus concentration and preempts this massive shift in the lake. And the paper as a whole suggested that a 10 to 30 year interval of flickering that is recorded in sediment cores of this lake follows nearly 750 years of relatively low variability in the composition and the diversity of the diatom community in this lake. So this could be used in other regions as a potential warning sign that some big shift such as eutrophication is about to happen. However, I wanted to also highlight that this isn't this particular paper isn't uncontested. If you want to see um, an argument that it could be a result of the way these authors dealt with their data, um, check out this second paper that I've cited on this slide here. I wanted to look next at how different stresses can interact. So one of the worries that we have currently is that multiple stresses are interacting to cause abrupt ecosystem changes, largely driven by human activity. When this happens, how do we work out which of the um, changes that humans are driving is having the biggest impact and what that impact is? Well, the f examples that I'm drawing on to illustrate this are observations of Caribbean reef corals, such as those shown on the left um, here, and some of the communities associated with this shown in the middle. This is actually an anemone here in the middle there. And we know 
based on observations of Caribbean reef corals, that they have suffered a dramatic decline since the 1980s. Since that point, we've seen the onset and then the intensification of coral bleaching, and we've seen an increase in disease events, and this has all been uh, linked to anthropogenic climate change. Of course, fossils and the rock record can help us put that change into context. They can help us understand the unprecedented nature of the changes that we're seeing now, as well as helping us to untangle the impact and the role of the contributing stresses. My example to kind of actually illustrate this in a bit more detail is based on the Panama back reef communities of this region shown on this map here. Um, it's actually um, where we are in the Caribbean is shown on this small inset map on the top right here. These were published by Kramer et al. in 2012 and Aronson et al. in 2014. And these papers showed that um, the high sediment and high nutrient runoff from agricultural lands in this region is a likely driver behind a shift between dominant coral species. So for mill millennia, we had dominance of one particular group of corals, members of the genus Porites, and that's changed relatively recently to members of another genus called Agaracea. This work suggests that not only have we seen this shift in the species makeup of these reefs, but that change has been accompanied by a simplification in the food webs that we see in this region. And a threshold was crossed perhaps as recently as the 1970s. So we've seen a dramatic shift in these ecosystems. And these papers help tie down what caused that shift and show the impacts it's had on the ecosystem as a whole. So that's a really valuable thing to be adding um, to this picture of what's happening in the region if you want to try and overcome these issues. I also mentioned in the first slide of this video that time series of fossil data can be used to help us identify feedbacks. And I'm, I'm drawing an example to illustrate this from the, world, from the um, work of Ireland and Booth, who published this in 2012, who used paleoecological data from CORS to show that upland deforestation by European settlers triggered an ecosystem state shift in an adjacent wetland area in Pennsylvania, actually in a place called Titus Bog in Erie County, shown on the right-hand side here. So that was a lot of words, but basically these guys used cores through these bogs to try and understand in kind of deeper time the feedbacks at play, which are summarized in this diagram that's shown on the left here. To simplify that a bit for you further, I wanted to highlight that in this event, we're seeing a sequence that starts with land clearance by settlers, that land clearance leads to more wind erosion of exposed soils. That leads to greater transport of nutrients on that wind into the wetland. And that triggers a, re a response in the wetland. The wetland plant communities shifted away from being largely moss-based to being primarily um, vascular plants. And that was coincident with this enrichment in nutrients that was the result of this shift in land use. All of that was then um, coupled with higher decomposition rates because nutrient enrichment stimulated microbial decomposition within these bogs. This, in turn, allowed more rapid nutrient cycling and that allowed this entire ecosystem to shift into a new post-settlement ecosystem state. So you've had this long chain of events that has fundamentally altered this important wetland ecosystem in this region, all of which um, is a response to changes in land use outside this area um, by humans. So this demonstrates to us that, um, well, in this particular instance, upland deforestation by European settlers triggered a cascade of ecological changes on a nutrient-poor peatland. And that enhanced dusty position and nutrient delivery on the surface. And it shows more broadly that indirect and unintended, often overlooked human disturbances can lead to dramatic changes in both the structure of ecosystems and in their functioning. In this case, that ecosystem is a carbon rich wetland ecosystem. And it highlights the kind of potential vulnerability of ecosystems such as this one um, in human dominated landscapes, even if we're not directly altering themselves 
altering them ourselves. So how do I sum this all up? Well, I've got a few things that I kind of, I, I wanted to say. Uh, first, I wanted to highlight that this, especially this last video is all cutting edge conservation paleobiology. Uh, this research is entering a new area, area, a new era, sorry, beyond just the applied use of these records of fossils or paleoecology to understand single environmental changes or stresses to look at the ecosystems as a more holistic whole. And this is a direction in which um, many people in conservation paleobiology and to the limited extent that I now know about it, I would agree, um, people think we need to move in that direction. So we're moving hopefully into an area where we can try and start to untangle multiple stresses. But more work is needed to improve our understanding of the dynamics of interactions when there are multiple stresses impacting on an ecosystem. And then um, we also need more work to understand the consequences that multiple stresses have on biological systems. We need to bear in mind that there are challenges in conservation by paleobiology as well. And I haven't um, focused on these in this lecture here because I was providing um, kind of an insight into how um, conservation paleobiology is useful. But we need to bear in mind its limitations. We have significant challenges when it comes to quantifying the resolution and the f fidelity of fossil assemblages. We know there are biases that occur in the preservation of fossils, but we don't have a clear understanding yet of how these can draw upon our ecological um, uh, kind of um, conclusions that we draw from those. We need to also better understand how to deal with scaling between the relatively kind of recent data, the data from cores that looks over the last few thousand years with deeper time paleobiological data. These two cover vastly different temporal and spatial scales. We're talking about thousands of years and in particular boreholes versus millions of years and whole continents. How do we compare those two? We don't really have an answer to that question yet. Furthermore, um, the world of conservation paleobiology probably needs to continue developing proxies that help us under understand the environmental and biotic conditions into the deep past and, uh, and um, to help us understand the co this context for today. Um, so at present, those are rarely calibrated um, to the accuracy and the precision of instrumental data that we can get from measuring modern day ecosystems. The more um, precise and accurate we can make our proxies that help us understand environmental conditions in the past, the more we can say about the responses from the biota that was alive at that time. If you want to have some more insights on this, I can highly recommend again this paper by Dietl et al. that was published in 2015. Um, and in our Zoom sessions, I'm going to introduce just a few more ca um, case studies, and then I'm going to look at something called GeoHeritage. But in the meantime, I hope that you have found this uh, kind of insight into conservation paleobiology um, interesting. I hope I've convinced you that as we move towards a, a world with mega cities such as this, um, understanding the consequences, the, the changes that developments such as this and other anthropogenic changes can have on um, environments both directly and indirectly is really important and that fossils can help us understand that better. And with that, I will leave you for this final video of conservation paleobiology and I will see you in the Zoom session. See you soon.